Good to have so many here tonight on a beautiful evening. I mean, I think spring is finally coming. What do you think? It's trying. <laughs> they had uh, snow. I don't remember where it was, somewhere in the Michigan area. It, it, it's hitting them right now, and it's going east. So I'm grateful that we still have some sunshine and some warmer weather. Although the other day it was snowing in our backyard and, and uh, blowing and wind and rain, and it was nasty up against the, uh, the uh, sliding window. But I'm grateful for today's weather. And for those that are homeless, I've got to deal with a, a, a homeless man this evening after we get done with the prayer meeting. I'm going to get him a, a room tonight. Um, I won't go to his story, but you know, if you're homeless and you've got bad weather, it's dangerous. So tonight we're going to get him a room. He's, he's moving back in the area. He's going to have a place here shortly, but for right now he's homeless because he doesn't have a, a place yet, but that's going to happen in a few days. So anyway, it's good to have you here tonight and uh, appreciate the people in the PA booth and, and all they do for us. You know, we don't ever see them, but they, what they do makes a difference, doesn't it? And if you would like to give them a thank you sometime, that would be, that would be nice. So they could feel like they are appreciated because they really, really, really are. Well, tonight um, we are going to progress in our in our study. We've been studying creation for the last four weeks, and uh, we're going to move into the Creator tonight and and discover more about Him as He describes Himself and. Um, the eternal God that we worship. But before we go into that, that study tonight, let's just for a moment sing a couple choruses. Would you like to do that? We'll do it a cappella, all right? I'm going to sing from Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. It's a little adapted so we can make the words work. But thou art worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord. You can look it up in your Bible if you have it there. To receive glory, Honor and power. Now, again, the version is a little bit different, but you can get the basic gist of the passage. This is the song that the angels and the 24 elders sitting around the throne of God sing. Now, we don't know the tune. We have a different tune, but we don't know the tune they sang there that John heard in vision. Can you imagine what music must be like in heaven? Glorious harps and trumpets and other stringed instruments played with a percussion beautiful. Let's sing together those words, right? Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord. Thou art worthy. To receive glory, glory and honor and power. For thou hast created, hast all things created. For thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasures they are created. Thou art worthy, O Lord. Now, that's how the song's written, but you can see it's based upon Revelation 4.11. Let's sing that together one more time here, a couple times, so you can get those words in your head. And if you can even harmonize it, it is such a beautiful, beautiful chorus. Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord. Thou art worthy to receive glory, glory and honor and power. For thou hast created, hast all things created, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasures they are created. Thou art worthy, O Lord. Just do it 
one more time, all right? Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord. Thou art worthy to receive glory, glory and honor and power. For thou hast created, hast all things created, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasures they are created. Thou art worthy, O Lord. By their saying he is worthy to receive glory, honor, and power, they are worshiping him. Because when we say that we're worshiping, we are declaring that God is worthy. Worthy of glory, honor, and power. Worthy of praise. Worthy of love. Now, my daughter, we've been promising her a puppy ever since we moved here. And I think we have finally found one. It will be delivered on Monday. And we went and looked at one the other day, and uh, oh, she picked up that little puppy, and she just, oh, she just held it and held it and held it. I said, Malay, do you like the puppy? No, I don't like it. I love it. I said, How, you don't even know this puppy. Oh, I love her. She's so soft. She's so sweet. I said, but she's going to get bigger someday. Oh, I love her, though. Now, she, wor she considered that puppy worthy of her love and adoration. Now, that's not the one we're going to get. We're actually going to get another one that's going to be a, a miniature poodle. But, oh, she felt the softness of that, and she loved that poodle. She considered it worthy of her love. Now, she wasn't worshiping it, okay? But when we come before God and we count him as worthy of praise and worship and prayer, we are saying he is worthy. He is worthy. Yes? Mm -hmm. Praise what? Yes, they praise the Lord. And you'll look in your hymnal. If you look in your hymnal, you'll see hymns that deal with worship and praise and adoration. Counting him worthy. And uh, what a Savior we have. Amen? And he is definitely worthy of our love. More than even a little puppy. Puppies are sweet, aren't they? I'll tell you what, who's sweet? God is sweet. We're going to ask the question tonight. Who is God? But before we do that, let's pray together, shall we? Father in heaven, tonight we have come here together in the house of worship here in Twin Falls to study together, to read together, to pray together, and to consider how worthy you are. So we ask tonight, Father, who are you? Who is Jesus? Who is the Holy Spirit? As tonight we try to break open just small portions of the scripture to discover you. Please be here tonight and teach us. May the presence of the Holy Spirit be here among us to sit with us in our seats. May he may be here to represent Jesus the Son who intercedes for us in your presence, who prays daily for us, who prays that we will be strong, that we will be victorious, that we will be overcomers in this world, that we will be true Israelites, true overcomers. Father, we thank you for your watch care over a universe that is so vast and that is so big and that we, that we can never, ever, ever fully understand it, or perhaps even you. Tonight, though, teach us, we ask. May holy angels stand in the aisles with us, 
and push out any influence of Satan and his nasty ones. We thank you in Jesus we pray. Amen. Who is God? Now, when I ask that question, it seems a little bit almost like, well, what do you mean? We all know who God is. We worship him. He's our creator. Let's look, though, at Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. And um, it's uh, the beginning of a story here that grows for the next the next 80 years, the next 40 years, I should say. But Exodus chapter 3. And I've got two microphones up here on this front pew, and I need somebody to take a mic and to be willing to read <clears throat> out of Exodus 3, 1 through 15 for us. Who would read over that microphone and come up here and get it? I can't bring it to you. I'd love to, but my legs don't work that way yet. All right, we got two volunteers. <laughs> So, all right, go ahead and take both mics, gentlemen, all right? We can have them different, two different locations in the sanctuary. And give them to somebody who's willing to read our passage here tonight, Exodus 3, 1 through 15. Who would like to read for us here? I will. Okay. 1 through 15? 1 through 15, all right? Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why this bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. So like a bunch of insects, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> Keep reading, okay? Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So the Lord said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Moses meets the God who he has known of all his life, his mother had taught him as a child until age 12 to know God. And even though he'd lived among the Egyptians and seen their false gods, he knew there was a creator God. And he says to God, who are you? What is your name? There before that bush that was burning. 
burning but not burning up. It was on fire, but it wasn't burning up. That was the mystery of it. You see a bush on fire, you expect it to burn up and shrivel away, but this was, it kept glowing. And he comes forward to see this, this thing and the voice, the angel of the Lord, and we find out later that's another term for God. Uh, but the angel of the Lord says, take off your shoes. Why? You're on holy ground. When we're in the presence of God, we're on holy ground. Moses takes off his sandals or shoes, whatever they were. I'm sure he kneels before the, the bush and to the voice. and Then he asks God, who shall I tell them that sent, sent me? And God said to him that he was... Haya. The name Haya, in English we say I am. It also can mean to happen, fall out, occur, take place, come about, come to pass. I am has sent you. Haya. A very, a very distinct name. And when Jesus used this name later in his life in Aramaic, they, he says, I am the good shepherd. I am the way. I am the truth. They knew what he was saying. He was using this distinct word designated for God. Similar to the word, well, we say Yahweh, but we're really not sure how to say it. Because you see in the Hebrew words, you see the, the little Lines underneath the haya, the little, little T's, those are the vowels. And they were put in by the Masoret rabbis to help the people remember how to say the words. Because Hebrew doesn't have vowels. In fact, modern day Hebrew has no vowels. The people just know what the words are. And so Yahweh, when the Masoretes came to put in dots for those, they said, mm, we don't want people to say this word. It's so precious. So they put dots in there, and you'll see in a minute, for another word, so they would mispronounce it. But if you go to Israel today, all of the wording in modern Hebrew, and it's different than biblical Hebrew, has no vowel points. A little dots and dashes, and you'll see in a minute what they look like. The people just know what the words are. Now, if you took the word, let's say, book, you would spell it not B-O-O-K, but you would spell it B-K. Now, how do you know that's book or, or not bike or buck? But the context of the sentence would tell you what that word is. So it's a very difficult language to learn to read, but they learn to do it. Now, if you were to take, let's say, the word God, it would be GD, God. No, 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 no vowel in it. But so that the people could memorize, uh, learn to, to read the words correctly, the, the Masoret scholars, uh, scribes put these dots and dashes under it. But look at Haya and look at Yahweh. And again, we're not sure how to say it. Um, but that's the holiest name of God in, in, in the Hebrew language. And, and the, the people of God would never say it. They would mispronounce it. And um, so we see the name Yahweh. Now, do you see those little dots and dashes and things? Those are the vowel points. They have put the vowel points for another name of God so the people would mispronounce it. So when they came to Yahweh, they would say Yahovah because it was the vowel points of another name of God, Elohim. And they did this to protect the holy name of God. So the name Yahovah, you know, Jehovah's Witness really get into this, that this is the holy name of God, this is what you shall call it, but it's a misnomer. That was the trip-up name. In fact, when they came to Yahweh or Yehovah, they would start to say, oh, that's right, that's not right. They would say, actually, rather than saying Elohim, they would actually say another name for God, which was Adonai, out of respect, because they didn't want to mispronounce this word. So there were three basic names for God. There was Yehovah, Yahweh, Elohim, and Adonai. Elohim meant the true God, and Adonai meant my Lord. 
These were the basic names of God in the Hebrew language. And we've seen in tonight's passage two of them used. Um, Elohim and, and Adonai. And of course, we also saw the one uh, where he said, I am, which is similar to Yahweh, but it's, it was a very sacred name as well. That I, the I am has sent you. The I am. I am. That's deep. Is it not? We can't even begin to understand the concept of it. I am. I heard a story many years ago, and I, it, it's almost a... They said that there, there was a black man and a white man. They were arguing over what the name of God was. How do you say his name? And the uh, white man said it was some one way, and the black man said it was another way. And then there was a crash of lightning and thunder, and a voice boomed, I am, that I am. Quoting out of Exodus here. And the white man got all excited. He started jumping up and down. I told you, I told you that God was white, not black. And the black man says, how do you know? He just said, I am that I am. He said, if he had been black, he would have said, I is what I is. <laughs> now, that's just a simple illustration. But the name I am is so holy. And when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the what? Life. He was saying that he was Yahweh or Yehovah or the I am. He was, he was saying this and they were ready to stone him for blasphemy. So Moses encounters three holy names for God here on the mountain. Yehovah, Elohim, Adonai, But in the term he was to use, I am, um, Yahu has sent me. Now, let's look here at some names. Jeremiah has in his name the name Yahweh or Yehovah. How do you know that? Because Jeremiah. If you were to see it in Hebrew, you would see the Yah there, spelling very much like Yehovah. Jeremiah, Elijah, Yah. These are Yah names. Um, Isaiah. Do you, hear the, do you hear the Yah in there? The name of God was in their name. These are little sentences about who God is. I can't remember what all these names mean. Now, there are also El names in the Bible, and you'll recognize some of these. Ezekiel, Elohim. El, when you see El, that's the name Elohim or El. Daniel. There's an L name. Here's another example, Mike L, one who's like God. You see, at the end of those names is the name of God, El or Elohim, and the Yah names is uh, Yahweh or Yehovah. So in their names, they even had the name of God as part of the sentence. These names are sentences. Like I say, Michael, one who's like God. Now, who is Michael? We know we believe that's Jesus in name before the incarnation. But these were very special, special names. And no wonder God said, don't take my name in vain. Now let's look at Genesis 1.1. -1. We've been studying Genesis 1.1 for the last several weeks, but let's, let's read it again, all right? Who would like to read that for us? If we have the microphone, maybe uh, you would read it for us. If you read it into the mic, would you please? It's right there next to you, okay. Genesis 1.1, what does it say? You all know it, but I want to have you read it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the what? In the beginning. Beginning, God or Elohim created the heavens and the earth. This is the name used there in Genesis. Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And we've talked about the beginning and our understandings of the beginning are so, it's such a hard thing to describe. How do you describe someone who's been here forever? How far back do you go? Doesn't that make your head spin? 
it, it goes back forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Now he can also go forward forever, and I can understand the forward part, but it's this backward part that just, how do you? How do you, how do you comprehend? How do you wrap your mind around? There's no beginning to it. It's just, it's just there forever. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Now, let's look at John 1, 1 and the following verses. Who would like to read John 1, 1? I will. Okay, Bill, you've got it. And you've got a microphone next to you, don't you? Yeah. Good. All right, John, this is, of course, the New Testament written in, in, in Greek. But we read some interesting and some familiar words, even that were found in the Old Testament. John, this is his introduction to the story of Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Stop there for a minute. What are the very first words of John's opening statement? In the beginning. In the beginning. Similar to Genesis, isn't it? In the beginning, God. Now he's writing, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was what? With God. With God, and, and the Word, the word was God. Was God. <coughs> now, we'll come back to some other verses in a minute there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We're going to find out in a minute who the Word was. Now, I want you to notice how the Jehovah's Witnesses translate this passage. They read it, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. They add the little word a in there. Well, I'll show you in a moment that you can't do that from, the, from the, the original Greek. It's not just a God, it was the word was God. See, they, they, they believe that Jesus was created as a, as a, as a, to become a God. They don't accept his divinity from eternity. But the words in the original language here from John 1.1 1, 1 are N-R-K, in the beginning. It's where we get the word for archaic. N-R-K, ain halagas. Kai halagas, ain prastantheon. Kai theos. Ain halagas. Now let me dissect that just a little bit, all right? In the beginning was the lagos, which is the word. Lagos. And kai, the lagos, ain prastan theon. Theon is the word for God. It's where we get our word theology from. The study of God, theos. Theon, theology. Kai theos, there's God again. Ein ha lagas. Now notice that word there before that says the kai theos. That's and God, the word was. Okay? But it says and God. It doesn't say a God. It doesn't say, like the Jehovah's Witness translated it. In the beginning, in the ARK, in Halagos, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now let's keep on reading in the English here now, okay? Let's go to Gen uh, John 1, 2 now. And Bill, would you keep reading for us? He was in the beginning with God. Keep on going. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Let's keep reading, okay? There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. 
But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Stop there. Now we know this is going to begin the story of Jesus on earth. And John calls him what? The Word. The Halagos. The Word. This is a powerful, powerful um, illustration. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning God created. And he, he brings out the fact that this Word was the Creator, doesn't he? And when the Creator created, what did he have to do to create life? He spoke it with his what? Word, his voice. <clears throat> There's power in the Lagos. There's power in the Word, in the voice of God. Who else in the universe can make things by just speaking them? Now, some, there's some craftsmen here in this room. And you've made things. You've taken your saws. You've taken your, your, your skills and you've made things out of wood or metal or whatever. There's some ladies here who have sewn things. You've created beautiful dresses or blouses or shirts. But you couldn't just say, I want a dress, and there it is, right? Or I want, I want an engine, and there's an engine. God can do that, though. Let there be land let there be trees let there be animals and yet these things just show up because in him in the word is something so beyond any of us in the beginning now notice how john starts just like in genesis in the beginning now those are the two english words we use in our lagos in the beginning was the word in the beginning, God created. Now, if you were to take the Hebrew there, where it sp speaks about in the beginning, uh, Bereshit is the word for beginning or Genesis. That's the name for Genesis. In the beginning, um, God created. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, because there were Jews living in Egypt that didn't speak Hebrew. They only spoke Greek. This is after the New Testament time, all right? They didn't speak Hebrew, so they spoke Greek. They were intellectual Jews, and they, they translated the Bible from the Hebrew into the Greek so they could read the Bible, just like we do into English. And their, their word in the beginning, God created, it would have been in arche, that Theon created. So, arche and beginning bear sheet in Hebrew, they're the same concept. Our God is from the what? Beginning. beginning. And again, like he said, if he's eternal, how far back is the beginning? He makes your head spin. You ever watch gymnasts do their thing when they're twirling around? Doesn't it make you just shake? I mean, I could never do those things. How many of you here were gymnasts ever in your life? Okay, how, did, how was it like to do that, Amy? Did it make your head spin? You didn't do that part, okay. I didn't either. Too. I, I remember in ninth grade, he, our teacher was teaching us how to jump over vault boxes. And I actually did it and scared my mother to death because I could have broke my neck. And it scares me now thinking about it. But in the beginning, God, it makes your head spin. Now, I love how Moses and John both bring it out in the beginning, in the beginning. Let's move on here to look at some other passages about God. Colossians 1, verses 15 and 16. And Amy, would you be willing to read? And I'm going to have a mic brought back to you. And uh, if you'd be willing to read Colossians 1, 15 to 16. And Amy, once you read that, you can hang on to the mic, and then you can pass it to the next person we'll have read. But Colossians, Paul writes this, this, this uh, epistle and he's speaking to the Colossian Christians. 
Colossians 1, 15 and 16, he's speaking of Christ here, and then he gets in more detail about who Jesus is. Is that mic not on? It was before. Oh, it is. All right, let's take the other mic back to you because we're recording this. That's why I want to have the mic and so you can also hear it. And... Oh, there you go. All right, good. Sorry, there we go. There we go, all right. <clears throat> he is in the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. How many things were created by him? All things. All things. Every tree, every leaf, every piece of celery, <laughs> every potato, every animal, and every liver in every animal, and every heart in every animal, and every human everything, every cell. And how many cells do we have? I can't even begin to account, can you? He made everything. And who is Paul speaking of here? Jesus. So who is Jesus? He is also creator, and we call him God in, in our language, or theos. He is God. He is Elohim. He is Adonai. But so is the Father. You know, and I love it there in the creation of man in Genesis, in Genesis 1. Let us make man in what? Our image. And that's not just the royal we. This is God the Father, God the Son. God, the Holy Spirit, saying, let's make man in our image. There's some personal connection there, but our, our God is, is something that is so indescribable. Now, the three, and we'll be talking about that here in the next few weeks, talking about the, what we term as the Trinity, which the word isn't in the Bible, but the triune God, the three in one, this is something we can't even grasp. Closest thing is maybe a family. Mother, father, child, brother. I don't know. We're all families. In our family, we're all Brysons. There's five of us, but we're all Brysons, but we're one family. Um, we've got Lewis's here. What do you got? Four in your family? Or are there five? Six? But you're all Lewis's. One family with six members. God Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God but one family but three individuals. And they are personal. And they are individuals. But we'll talk about that later. Jesus is called the creator. By him all things that were made were created by him and for him. Let's turn to Isaiah 57, 15. Who would like to read that for us? And we'll have the mic pass to you. Isaiah 57, 15. Here's Isaiah, the prophet of God with the name of God in his own name. Isaiah 57, 15. Who wants to read that for us? Lorenzo, would you read that for us? All right, bring the mic to you. Lorenzo, I, gotta, I tell you, I, the way I remember your name was I had a friend in, when I was in first and second grade. His name was Lorenzo. And that he was... He could He's be about our guy. age now, so you he may be. Guy, he, wasn't he? You weren't him. Okay, I don't know what his last name was, but he was Lorenzo. <laughs> fifty-seven, fifteen. Okay. What does it say? There? Isaiah 57, 57, 15. For for thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So here, and Lorenzo, that was beautiful, but here we have God who is called 
the high and what? Lofty one. Is that appropriate to call God the high and lofty one? Who else tried to grab that name, by the way? Lucifer did. He wanted to be the high and lofty one, didn't he? But who is the high and lofty one? It is, he's eternal, he's holy. Um, Isaiah is speaking of him here. I don't remember no, which name he's using here from the Hebrew, but he is the high and the lofty one. Um, he makes us contrite and humble. Now, if you were to be in the presence of God literally, face to face, if I were to come into his presence, would we be able to stand? Why? His glory would just out overwhelm us. It would kill us. Yes. When I drive Malia to school, and it's on a clear day, and there's no clouds, the sun is right in our faces. We're driving east. And it hurts to see. I've got to pull down the visor, put shades on, but it's, it's, it's almost impossible to see the cars coming at you. We can't look at the sun for very long without damaging our eyes, can we? When that eclipse came here just last year, could you look right at the eclipse without vision to cover it? No, because it can burn your, your retina. And if God's, if the sun is something we can't look at and God's glory is brighter than the sun, it would absolutely kill us. When Moses asked God, let me see your glory, God says, you can't look at me and live. Remember that? You can't do that, Moses, but I'll put you in a, in, in a crack in the rock and I'll walk before you my backside and I'll let you peek at my backside. And it must have been awfully bright. Because when Moses came off the mountain before the people of Israel again, his face was glowing so bright they couldn't look at him. He had to put a veil over his face. He had to put a, a visor over his face, like we have in our car or something, shades, sunglasses. So the high and the holy one lifted up. Someday we will see his face. That's the promise in, in Revelation. We'll look at that another week. Someday we will see his face. Isn't that a mark, mark, remarkable? He's going to transform us. And he's going to give us a new name. He's going to write that new name on a stone, a white stone. Oh, wow. I just, I mean, there's so many things about God we, we can't even begin to, to con conceive of tonight here. Let's look at Revelation 4.11. We sang those words tonight. Revelation 4, verse 11. And who would like to read that for us? volunteers. Okay, good. 4.11. Read the words here again. This is in John's vision in heaven. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasures they are and were ex are created. We sang a version of that tonight here. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have what? <laughs> Created all things. There's the creation motif again. You know, and yet man in his arrogance wants to say it all evolved out of slime and then moved into other creatures and become something that could walk on four legs and finally breathe and stand up and become a human. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Man can't, I mean, if any of you wanted to make a car and you took all the pieces of a car and laid them out on the driveway and say, all right, now car, make yourself, I mean, it would evolve. I mean, would it happen? Yeah. Never. It takes a designer and it takes craftsmen. At the GM plant, wherever they have them in Detroit area, they, those cars are not just, they don't just happen. Mechanics put them together in an assembly line and they're intelligently designed by engineers. Yet we think that we just came out of nothing, just it happened by chance. No way. For you have, he says here, created all things. Now, obviously God has not created cars, but he's given man the intellect to be able to build a car. He created man. He created the stuff that man builds the car out of, the, the steel, the iron, the uh, 
the leather. You know, I mean, those were eventually what time some black Angus cow would hear in the field. Who knows? You know, but exactly. Who can create a brain? That is the most amazing computer. And yet it's just a mass of tissue and electrons. My grandfather used to love cow brain. Oh my, he used to eat that stuff. I don't know if that ugh, makes me crawl to think about. He'd have my grandmother scramble it with eggs. I guess this, uh, whatever. <laughs> but um, he is the creator of all things. Let's look at Romans 11.34. Who would like to read Romans 11.34 for us? I, William, do you want to read that for us? Yes. I know you read well. Let's look at the Romans chapter 1. For what? Hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. 11.34, go ahead. For who the mind of the war, or who have been the counselor? Who knows the what? Mind oh, of the Lord. Imagine what his mind, what his brain must be like. He can think and it becomes. I want a bird. I need a papaya. You know, there it is. Now, when he came to man, he formed him out of dust. So you breathe, and there's a very personal thing. But God can conceive in his mind and there it becomes. God said, that's right, that's the word, see? And John borrowed that, the word said. Let's look at Job 36, 26, all right? Job 36, 26. Who would like to read that for us? Uh, Job 36, 26. By the way, you know who wrote the book of Job? Moses. Moses did. He wrote it when he was in Midian, residing in the house of his father-in-law. He wrote it before he wrote Genesis. You see, Job was a man of, of that part of the world. His story was known. Job 36, 26. Who would read that for us? Okay, go ahead, Cynthia. Behold, God is great, and we know him not. Neither can the number of his years be searched out. Neither can the numbers of his years what? Search out. Be discovered or searched out. How, you cannot conceive this eternal loving Father who has always been there. Now, here's the, here's the question I have asked before. And I don't know if we've asked it in the creation section of our study, but if God has been forever, the triune God, was that triune God forever alone or were they forever creating? I don't have an answer for it. I mean, if you go on back, 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 and how big is this universe? It goes on, 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 on. So has he been forever creating or were they forever alone? I mean, it just makes, I don't think we'll ever even conceive of it even when we're in glory. But how marvelous he is that he could create the universe, the stars, the planets, our bodies, life, Angels, I mean, who do we think we are when we get so arrogant? Yes, Bill. When they uh, put the Hubble telescope uh, into orbit and started looking at the uh, cosmos, they found that there were more galaxies out there than there are stars in our galaxy. <laughs> it blew their minds totally out because they were looking whenever they first looked they said, well, let's look at this empty spot in uh, the heavens, see, what, see if there's anything there. And there were so many galaxies there, they didn't know what to do about it. One of these nights, I'm going to show you a, a, a video of this guy who looks at the universe, and they've been able to take pictures of some of these things with the Hubble. And when you <coughs> see what's out there and how small Earth is compared to what's out there, it just makes your head spin. You won't want to miss that night. I'll let you know when I find it. It's in my library here somewhere. I'm still sorting my library now. But it's amazing. We cannot conceive of what this universe is like, but we have a God who thought it in his mind, who spoke it, who brought it to us. 
So who is God? Can we describe who God is? We really can't, can we? But I love him, don't you? I don't just like him, I love him, and he loves us. Malia is waiting to pick up that dog on Monday. And she can hardly wait. The dog will be nine weeks old, and she's going to be just in love from first sight. But God loved us. So because he loved us first, we ought to love him, right? There's that song, because he first loved me, right? Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. I mean, when my friend Bill Shy rescued us out of the airplane, I loved him because he was my rescuer. When I met my wife and I began to know her, I loved her because she first loved me. She was praying for me before I knew her. Oh, how I love Jesus. How about you? Oh, I love his Father and I love the Holy Spirit. As we look into the idea of the triune God and the Trinity here in the next few weeks, I've been trying to reshape the way I speak about the Holy Spirit Many times I'll speak of, Father, would you send your Holy Spirit? Would you, send, would you speak to me by your Spirit? And that seems to merge the Holy Spirit with the Father himself. But when he's a distinct individual, I'm, I'm wanting to more and more say the Holy Spirit rather than your Holy Spirit because they are two separate portions of the Godhead. And I tell you what, I, I, I will be very upfront with you, and I say this humbly, I have met the Holy Spirit at least twice personally. Did I see him? No. I heard his voice and I felt his presence and I felt his peace. One time was in the airplane when we were coming down. The other time was in the shower when I was fighting with God over whether I should surrender to have my brain operated on. <laughs> and when I met the Spirit in person, he is very, very comforting and loving. Jesus called him what? The comforter, the counselor. And he represents the father and son very beautifully because that's their nature too. They're comforters and they're counselors. Pardon? Leads us to all understanding. So as we continue to grow through Wednesday nights, Bring your Bibles, bring questions, bring your intellect, bring your love for Jesus because we must grow closer to him before he comes because then we'll appreciate him all the more when we're in his presence. Do you believe that? I saw a painting, I'll have to show you here in, a, in a, sometime here. just saw it this week on, on Facebook of this lady, she's hugging Jesus there in heaven. And the look, you don't see the face of Jesus. You just see her face. And the joy on her face is like, I can't believe I'm finally meeting you. <laughs> Isn't that, don't you just wait to the day when we can hug Jesus? Won't that be awesome? Hug the Father and look into their face and say, I love you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We have a little dachshund at home. He's 11 years old. This is why we got to get Malia a puppy so the dachshund can, when he fades off, he won't leave her behind. Nothing, but um, when he looks at us with his little precious face, little brown and black face, and he's got little eyebrows, you know, and he looks at you like, please pick me up. <laughs> you can't resist. When God looks into our face, we will not be able to resist his love. Amen? Well, it is almost 8 o'clock. I told this gentleman I got to meet him at 8.30, so I've got to close up here. But let's pray, shall we? And I would encourage you now to get into groups of two and three and to pray together. No one alone. And then when it's all quiet, don't, when you're done praying, just remain quiet and then we'll pray together as a group, all right? Would you find somebody to pray with? Make sure everybody has a partner, two or three.
Don't let anybody be alone. Pauline, we've got to find somebody here for you. Pray together. Break, lift your heart before God, okay? You have four in your group. That's okay, too. All right? Let's bow our heads and you pray. Father, hear us now as we pray. Hear these dear friends of yours. Lord Jesus. Father in heaven, as the name Jesus told us to call you, he said, when you pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, we thank you for being our God, for being our creator. We thank you that in your presence where you and the Son and the Holy Spirit dwell, that you care about us, that you created life, even though we... Um, 
our ancestors turned and sinned and we have all followed in their footsteps now as sinners. We thank you for the willingness of our creator Jesus to come personally as, as a baby and as, to grow up into a human man and to become a carpenter and a teacher and a healer and finally our death on, on the cross and our resurrection. Because he died and rose, he's coming again and we just long for the day when we will see him and see you and see the Holy Spirit. Teach us to be humble. Teach us to be subservient to you and to each other. And all the more as we see the day approaching. Tonight we just peek through a hole to understand who God is, just who, who you are. I wish we could see you now, but we have to wait. In the meantime, live in our hearts through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Dwell there and guide us. Be with these tonight here who have prayed for different needs and, and, and issues. I pray that you would answer them according to your will. Be with this uh, young man tonight who's moved back here from Utah. He's looking for work and for a home here. I pray that he will grow to know you. Evidently, he came to some of the meetings we had with Tim Rosenberg. So, Father, may he... May he uh, be discovered by you and by this church. So, Father, tonight again, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your glory. And together, all God's people said together as we close in prayer through Jesus, Amen and Amen. Amen comes from the Greek word Amen, which means let it be so. Or verily, you know when Jesus said verily, verily in the King James? That's amen, amen. Truly, truly, I say to you, and that's what he would say. So God is the one who, oh, by the way, how many of you did not receive a copy of the study I did on the, on the, the uh, age of the earth? I gave them out Sabbath, but some of you weren't here Sabbath. Did any of you not get one? All right, raise your hand. Um, just take the mother. Um, Kevin, did you get one, and, and, and Cynthia? Yeah. Okay, make sure you get one there. This is not a perfect study, believe me, because it was done by a human, but hopefully this will answer some of the questions we've been dealing with, with the, on the study of the Creator, and I hope it's a help to you. This is a revised version that I had to, um, oh no, that I had to, uh, in a minute we'll go look, okay? I had to, um, hang it, don't go away. But, um, I had the privilege of meeting some of my professors back at Andrews when we were there for spring break and getting some more information from them. Um, we've got some marvelous teachers there at Andrews that love the Lord. All right. Good night, everybody, and uh, we'll see. Well, this Sabbath, Lorenzo will be sharing his testimony here at Twin Falls. I'll be at, I'll be at uh, Buell. And then the next week we'll be back here at Twin, and then we'll be at o o Oasis, no, no, Olive Tree, and then we'll get out to Eden Valley here sometime soon. But we're so glad to have you Eden Va Valleyites here with us tonight. And it's a nice name that you have out there, Eden, is it not? It's where it all began. That's where we tell everyone. All right. Good night, everybody. And um, I, if you can come with me to my office, let's look for those studies, okay? Tell your wife hello. Tell your wife hello, okay? I will. Do you ask that gentleman to come in and fly that seat for manufacturing? Pardon? Ask him to come in and fly and start dropping.